server starting. Let me see if everything works. Poink, poink. All right. Ooh, the chat box is, is entering. All right, we're gonna wait for five minutes. People are joining. Hello, Vikings. Let's wait. Let's wait. We're not officially starting. We're gonna we're gonna have a five minute booster, so everyone gets um, in the chat and stuff like that. Hello, everybody. Uh, a little sound check. Check, check, check. Whoa! Is is my voice super cool and handsome and Viking like? Can you hear me okay? By the way, did the, did the link that I provided work? <laughs> I think it did. Sounds great, super cool. All right, we're gonna wait exactly three more minutes, okay? Hello everybody. I'm so glad that everyone has joined. We're not starting yet, we're just waiting for everybody. So no one is left behind. You know, what one of our Viking rules, no one left behind. The village thrives if we take care of everybody and each other, right? <laughs> Sorry, I can't play any music because I'm afraid for, uh, I'm afraid of the stream is going to be shut down. So the only music you're going to get for now is my amazing voice. By the way, did you like, um, <laughs> Did you like my Viking voice in the trailer? It took a while to do that. A whole day of uh, pitch changing. <laughs> Sorry I can't read every message in the chat, but I'll try to if... I have my moderators see everything. Please don't be jerks. If you're gonna be jerks, we're gonna ban you immediately. <laughs> Without hesitation, Thor's hammer is gonna go up on your head and you're gonna disappear into nothingness for eternity. <laughs> uh, Alright, two more minutes. Two more minutes and we are starting. Yeah, how's everybody evenings today? How many countries do we have? I'm curious. Can you write in the chat where you're from? I know we have a lot of people from US, we have a lot of people from Russia, I think. A lot of people from Ukraine. Um, yeah. USA, USA, Brazil, oh my God. Germany, Ukraine, India, Mexico, France, Bulgaria, Chile, England. Would you like some tea? Russia. Japan, holy crap, we are international Vikings. Well, Vikings did travel a lot. All right, I have one minute until we're starting. So everything that I'm babbling right now, this is just, you know, this doesn't count. <laughs> Canada, Netherlands, hey, true Vikings are here. Peru, Atlantis, <laughs> Greenland. Hindustan, Montenegro, yeah, Portugal, Turkey. Holy crap! Anyways, a lot of people. Wow. All right. So, welcome everybody. Welcome to the lecture one of our epic Valhalla for Artist Visual Development Camp. Camp for real Vikings, real. <laughs> Real artist warriors who want to improve, you know, level up their skills and explore an amazing world of visual development art, you know. And, you know, I'm going to start this 
epic journey with super cool epic words of King Theoden from Lord of the Rings when they were in Helm's Deep. So it begins, right? So, the reason you're all here, right, is probably you have some kind of artistic urge. You want to tell stories. You want to understand how to tell stories, but most importantly, right, what are the tools to tell great stories and how do companies work with storytellers? And the title of those storytellers who are artists is called Visual Development Artist, right? So we're gonna dive in right into that, but just as an introduction, hello, my name is Misha Opliff. I've been in the industry as Visual Development Artist for how many years? Almost six? Yeah, almost six years. And that's all I do every day for 10 hours plus, right? Oh man, do we have, do you, you guys can hear the crows? <laughs> man, maybe Odin is with us right now. Should I close the windows? I don't know. Uh, the crows are kind of being crazy. You know what? Give me a second, I'll close the windows. <laughs> uh, does, is, it is it too distracting? Are the crows too distracting? A little, okay. One second, let me, let me try to do something with them. Give me 30 seconds. <laughs> Stupid crows, go away. Go away, crows. Go away. They probably know I'm starting to lecture. Something had to go wrong, right? Or, or it's not Misha's stream, I guess. All right, I battled the crows. They are laughing at me. Did you hear that one crow who just went wah, wah, wah? Anyways, <laughs> let's pretend that didn't happen. Yeah, they protest, see? Um, hopefully, I closed all the windows. Hopefully, I'm not gonna die over overheating. <laughs> Dramatic crow. All right. So, hello everybody again. My name is Misha Opliff. I've been in the visual development for almost six years, mainly as a color key artist, but I've done a lot of pre-production stuff, you know, for animation, for games, and stuff like that. Here's my face. You know, this is me, Misha Opliff. You know, this is how I look. I know I look 16, right? But feel, I can't grow a beard. So that's why I, 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 I draw a lot of bearded Vikings, you know? But this is how I feel. This is actual Misha, you know? This is the real me. Not this, this, right? So now you'll know a little bit about me, you know? I work for companies like Netflix Animation. I worked with Jam Jimmy Fallon on Five More Sleeps Short. I worked for Netflix Game, Oculus. Uh, Respawn Entertainment, EA, etc, etc, etc. Like, I do a lot of stuff for Clash of Clans, mainly as a color script artist, but a lot of work that I do does involve visual development, being an early blue sky stages of everything, right? So I'm gonna open my doodle pad, uh, get used to my teaching style. Uh, I am I'm gonna be doodling as I speak, like on a blackboard or a whiteboard, you know? And today's topic is right what is visual development i want to you know just tell my side of the story i want to get you excited about this potential profession that you want to dive into you know and we're just gonna briefly touch on every aspect of visual development right and then we have a whole 10 weeks <laughs> it's actually 10 weeks now of diving deeper in each profession the main goal of today is for me to get you excited about the whole profession in general, right? Talk about examples, right? And after everything is done, we're going to have a Q&A session. And for people who missed this lecture, they can attend it after uh, the stream, right? Or uh, they can watch it in the recording. 
So, what is visual development, right? What do they do? What is their role in the whole pipeline for the project? Honestly, I don't like to put people on a pedestal, but visual development artists are pretty cool people, right? They're little gods of their own universes, right? Or the universe of the project itself. We tackle everything that needs pre-visualization, right? But where do we start? Each project, game, animation series, or a feature film with an animation or live action needs characters, right? So the first branch of visual development is character designers, right? Because we need our Mr. Incredible, right? We need like our Aragorn and Gandalf and all those characters, right? And that's what the character designers usually tackle first, right? There's an interesting misconception of what visual development actually is, right? Because um, there's a word concept art, there's word visual development, and a lot of people misuse the word visual development just to know, just to use it as a cool, <laughs> cool extra text on the art station post, right? You draw a house, and it just looks like a regular house, but then if you put visual development onto it, the house looks much cooler now, right? So, what's the difference between concept art and visual development? Hopefully, we can answer this question by the end of this lecture, so stick with me. So, the beginning stages, right? When the, when the, when the project just gets announced, right? We have our main cast, right? And they're designed by the character designers. Right. There's all kinds of stages of character development, right? Mainly, we start working in 2D, right? So on the left, I'm going to have uh, one of my doodle board. And you're more than welcome to make notes, you know. Uh, on the left, uh, I have 2D pipeline. And on the right, I'm going to have 3D pipeline. Because believe it or not, 3D people can do visual development too. And I'll explain why. They're not usually thought of as visual development artists, but they can do a lot of vis dev and pre-visualization. So, first job is character designers, right? What is role, the role of a character designer? First of all, you know, is to figure out what is the main story around this character, right? Figure out their body types, figure out what their characteristics are. Are they like super cool warrior? Are they not? Are they an alien looking spinkadoodle from Mars? Right? And stuff like that. And there's some examples that are provided here, right? Of how character design usually looks like. And there's a few stages that uh, character design uh, goes through. So, first is this exploration. So, for example, I'm have some sketches from Lord of the Rings by uh, Alan Lee and John Howe, I think, right? Some of them are just super loose, you know, and you start loose usually in the beginning just to explore and figure out what's going on, right? You explore some faces, orcs, or even Vikings, you know, this is some Klaus designs before he was finalized. And visual development stage, especially in blue sky stage, right? You have to go as wide as possible and find the right combination of things that sells your character for your story of the best, right? We're going to dive into pipeline uh, on our lecture three after our guest speaker on Tuesday, right? So right now I'm just going to be talking about professions in general in different branches. So don't worry, later on you will understand where each of the profession fits in in the whole pipeline. So right now, just singularly what each station kind of does, right? So another thing is that character designers do, right? They First of all, they explore who the character is, and after a while, they explore a little bit more, and they give a design sheet later on into the production. But we're going to talk about it later. Also, you know, Character designers or vis dev for characters, right? Usually, there's, in my opinion, uh, vis dev is a little bit more not as specific to character design. So, you can technically call a character designer a visual development artist, right? But I say you can call character designer a visual development artist if he does something besides only developing a character, 
right? It's always comes in a package and I'll explain a little bit later. So let's dive into a little bit into the 3D side of things, right? So for example, uh, on top of, um, on top of like 2D concepts, people can also do uh, sculpts, you know, they can do sculpts in 3D um, on a computer, right? Or they can do it in clay. So for example, I know that Peter Jackson on Lord of the Rings, he had a whole shop um, making orcs, making creatures. And sometimes the 2D, the 2D team, which is in the beginning was mainly Alan, Alan Lee and uh, John Howe, right? They would sometimes not even communicate. Why? Because, you know, sculptors are artists too. And sometimes it's faster for them to, you know, try the design hands-on with clay, right? So if it's easier for you to pre-visualize uh, everything in 3D, why not use 3D, you know? It's whatever faster for the production and stuff like that. So we're not talking about game-ready assets for actual use in the games, right? We're talking about sculpting as a medium to loosely, very fast, see something on your screen, right? And sometimes the narrative can be 2D driven, but sometimes you just need to have hands-on, there's a lot of texturing and stuff like that. It depends on the director, it depends on the artist itself, but there's a possibility to do pre-visualization for characters right away in clay or in 3D. I remember I attended this one workshop at um, artillery event in St. Petersburg, and I forgot sadly the name of the uh, of the sculptor but he only worked in traditional medium right and he was hired for many many movies without sometimes without any 2d concept art to base his sculpts off from so he would get a task or some keynote sometimes a script sometimes this sometimes that and he would do a series of either portraits, like for example, I'm pretty sure that guy also did, maybe he did this one, I'm not sure, but he did some Kong, uh, Kong Skull, Skull Island uh, face sculpts of, of, uh, of King Kong, you know? And um, they then used it as inspiration to pass on later to 2D artists and 3D artists, right? So, Pipeline of visual development is not as simple as you think. Anything can technically work as long as you are solving a problem, right? So thing number one, right? We talked a little bit about the character design aspect of it, right? But here's one conclusion that we can come to. First of all, visual development artists are problem solvers, right? In a visual medium. As long as it solves some kind of a problem, you can technically, visually, you can technically call it visual development, right? Let's dive in a little bit deeper, right? So we discuss characters, but characters cannot live in a void, right? We're also, we're not only real people creators because they have to be believable. We have to basically be able to touch them and, and hug them and talk to them and be empathetic with them, you know? We understand what their motivation is all through character design, which is amazing, you know? We are, we're all, our own people makers, basically, you know? That's why I said we're all our own little gods of our universe as, as artists, right? But characters cannot survive in the void, right? They need an environment to, for them. So that's when we come to the next topic, which is environment artists, you know? Very challenging, super, un, uh, I would say, I would say super rare, but a lot less people become environment artists than character designers or character artists, right? Because how many kids do you know that were drawing, not stick figures, but mountains when they were like two? <laughs> not many, right? So uh, station number two, right, is environment art. And I'm just gonna just, you know, I'm just gonna draw a mountain with the sun to represent it, you know? We have 2D pipeline and also 3D pipeline. Let's talk a little bit about 2D pipeline first, and then I'm gonna dive into 3D. Um, so first of all, what do environment artists do? You know, environment artists are responsible to create the world, the ecosystem. You know, sometimes even 
uh, you know, what the atmosphere is like, what gravity is like. If it's a sci-fi movie, you have to figure out, like, was it raining acid rain, toxic acid rain for, like, 500 years? Who knows, you know? Is it, is it the jungle? Is it, the, is it snowy mountains? So environment artists are creating just the biomes, you know, where the character is going to act. It could be an epic Viking hole that we are imagining. <laughs> that we're sitting in right now, you know, or it could be, it could be anything, right? And like I, I have some uh, a little bit of um, um, examples of what environment art looks like, right? And sometimes it's super loose, you know, it's just a layout in line work in black and white just to figure out how it's gonna look. This is kind of environment slash keyframe, you know, uh, and we're gonna talk about mixed professions in the visual development uh, profession. Right, just right now, just talking about singular ones. So, um, yeah, like there's different responsibilities of environment artists because if it's for movies or animation, they have to understand that two um, D characters are going to be acting on top of their sets. Right, so it's a different skill set to design environments for animation. It's a different skill set to design environments for games, for example, because Games have gameplay. Uh, games have player experience. It doesn't need to be confusing and stuff like that, right? Then we have like environment artists uh, for, let's say, as matte painters for uh, feature film and stuff like that. They can design it first, and if they have matte painting skills, they can uh, push it till the end and stuff like that. Uh, environment is super hard. I won't say super niche, but it's a little bit harder than characters, you know. You need a little bit of, a little bit of a different perspective on the world. And environment artists can also do previews in in three D. You know, uh, I got some examples here. For example, right? They can do in three D and live. Like for example, on Lord of the Rings. I know that's not the exact set, and they may have some concept art before that. But for example, they they made a live replica of Minas Tirith. For example. Uh, how exactly the pipeline went? They could have started with 2D and then, and then the actual modelers came in. Sometimes, you know, sometimes people will start modeling something right away, and he, they're gonna be like, "Hey, I did, I did some, you know, architecture sculpting in real life." You know, for example, James Garney <laughs> uses his environment skills almost like 3D, but this is actual sculptures that he did to pre-visualize his painting before he started painting, right? So this is not actually 3D, this is more like real life, but it's technically 3D, right? Because when we use ZBrush or Maya or Blender, for example, that is super awesome, we're doing exactly the same thing, right? We're using 3D assets to pre-visualize something to make our life easier and to solve some kind of a uh, visual problem that either gonna help us or people future on in the pipeline, right? Unreal Engine is a pretty good example or any engine uh, that you can put assets on. I know that in different productions that I was in, a few artists, um, a few artists would actually go ahead of the 2D team and build something really fast and cool in real in unreal you know in terms of composition lighting overall feel for example just because you just you throw a bunch of uh, assets together you put the skybox on you put the lighting on and then the 2d team can get inspired by it and then either change the style make it more pinterly make it more stylized but again see the coloration between uh different professions what we're doing is like we're solving a visual problem to then push the story forward, right? And honestly, almost anything can go uh, in terms of who does what and stuff like that. It depends on the production. Uh, it depends on the director, because, and like for example, Leica Studios with their with their characters that they're doing everything stop motion. Their pipeline may vary a little bit, right? But there is a standardized. Uh, type of a deal thing in terms of the visual development pipeline and we're gonna talk it, about it a little bit later so yeah those are um, 2d and 3d environment artists and what they do right they create the biome uh, they create the world for the character they have to think about many things right where do people get water uh, where do people live 
What's the infrastructure, right? How do they pay taxes? Are there roads to each village, right? Uh, is there dangerous creatures around? Do they need to build fences around their houses? You know, it's, it's a whole different puzzle, right? And that's what we are. We're puzzle solvers. You know, we create an awesome, cool puzzle. And more complex and awesome it is, more satisfying it is to solve, you know? All right, after environment artists, right? Uh, we're gonna have like you know prop designers, and it could be part of environment artist job, you know. Uh, but it could be also a separate thing, you know. Uh, props vary from, um, you know, like for example, this one is super cool. Sadly, I forgot the name of the artist, right? But this is this is props slash environment art, right? For Blizzard um, cinematics, right? And he's like, right, like what the beer cans look like right where's the table what what inhabits in terms of like day-to-day -day items and utilities that uh, the characters use right and the pipeline varies a little bit from uh, 2d projects to 3d projects like conception for them and stuff like that but overall it's kind of the same right sometimes this profession of prop designs can be super kind of like niche and you can be like i'm doing only props but most often than not prop design is responsibility of an environment artist right so i'm gonna put it under environment art right next to it right we're gonna i don't know we're gonna have a a cup for example that's gonna represent our props you know and you know some people are faster to do things in 3d so for example some like you know, some, someone's gonna say hey can you just mock up like 300 cups for me so my 2d team has something to paint over and you know what 3d artists can do that sometimes you know uh oh Zorin Vasily thank you that's the artist who did the Hearthstone thing um yeah so let's get I guess <laughs> to to the fun stuff, right? A lot of people here are probably illustrators, right? And illustration can be its own thing, you know. Illustration can like there's a promo art, right? Uh, there is uh, there's splash art and stuff like that. I'm not really talking too much about it but it can be part of visual development right because sometimes what people need to see is we need to see the final look of our um, frame or gameplay frame and you make an illustration and technically it is polished art but it is solving a visual problem right and that visual problem is how does our game look cleanly and awesome sometimes illustrators would paint pieces that would just be for pitching you know they would do a fake movie poster mock-up for example for uh, for a movie pitch to a studio and they need to see the feel you know it's kind of like you know you know when people do like a fake project uh, for like a fandom movie and they, they make a fake poster and people are like, wow, this feels super awesome and cool. That's what illustrators can do sometimes. Also, illustrators can do keyframes and other a little bit more loose things, but those are different professions, right? For, for illustrators, I'm going to just put this little thing, I don't know, with a character, with a sword. That's going to represent illustration, right? Can people do three illustration in 3D? You know, like for example, Supercell, they do all their <clears throat> splash arts in 3D. Sometimes even without 2D pre-visualization, sometimes with 2D pre-visualization. So technically, if you're really good at 3D and really fast at modeling, you can technically model a whole set of characters, pose them, light them, and then make a render. And that's gonna be technically illustration. So can it be done in 3D? Absolutely. Is it traditional in terms of like, do we encounter it a lot of the times? No, not really, but it is possible, right? And I do want you to understand the whole picture. You know, I do want you to, to kind of see little niches too, because my goal right now is for you to open a roadmap, a potential where you can, you know, express your artistic voice. 
uh, see where you fit into all of this. So when you're listening to this or watching, you know, try to see what resonates with you the most. You know, because especially if you're an unexperienced artist and just starting out, this is a great place just to get a feel and a taste for what is going on in the industry. And you can test it out. The main thing, guys, don't get overwhelmed. Overwhelmed. There's no need to decide on your profession right here and right now, right? There's a lot of time for experimentation and see what fits you best, right? Because the industry needs strong voices, you know, and people who really enjoy what they do. You know, the main reason why games and movies fail nowadays is because people are not enjoying what they do anymore. Or the producers and directors and story writers. But that's a whole another story. <laughs> All right, what comes after illustration, you know? Um, so now we are diving to the fun part. Keyframes for animation. So a uh, little disclaimer, mainly I'll be talking about animation pipeline. This is kind of where I work, mainly. Right. We're going to cover the game and film industry pipeline for sure, right? But for the most part, they have a lot of similarities. And as a good example, where I have more experience in, it's going to be animation. So illustrators, we understand what they're doing, right? In visual development, right? They, they can pre-visualize something clean, something cool, something final in the game, right? And, and maybe establish a style and stuff like that and put one illustration. But then there comes keyframe art, right? And keyframe art is super cool, super interesting, and one of my favorite things to do, right? Like in examples, I'm gonna show like there's there's a super cool project that sadly never took off. It's called Previsia. Uh, a bunch of Polish people did it. I forgot. And all of their last names are ends on Czechobowski <laughs> or E. Uh, I will link all of them probably in a separate PDF file, right? But what is the main goal of a keyframe artist, right? It's explore potential of the story with a few frames. For example, right, let's, let's look at this. I have no idea what the project is on, about, you know? But if I'm a director, and this is a pitch to me, um, from the, from the art team, right? Or I am a potential investor and this director put up a team together that painted this. I'd be like, okay, I see the setting. Uh, I see that there's people, you know, there's some kind of like tribal people and probably the boy is the main character. Those are the side characters and they're traveling, you know? And Keyframe is created for a few reasons. First, explore the stories. Instead of making the whole movie, you can, date, you can make 10 Keyframes and explore the whole character arc and present it to the director or look at it yourself and see, is the story even worth telling, right? Uh, another thing that keyframes are really good at is first explorations to raise questions, what are your stories going, for example, because a lot of the times the directors have uh, a few ideas they want to test them out. Sometimes they want to test them visually, right? Most of the times keyframes are created for pitch books to potential investors and stuff like that. And then later on when the production is already going on is to explore, explore a little bit uh, deeper into each beat of the movie. We're gonna go into the pipeline deeper on our next sessions. I'm, I really want to dive into it. I have to hold myself from doing it. So please keep me accountable so this lecture is not four hours long, <laughs> okay? Um, yeah, so for example, the examples that we see here, this one was done for Smallfoot, uh, I think by Marcin Jakubowski, yes. And almost none of those shots made into the final movie because I'm pretty sure they, they developed it with um, Sergio Pavlov's, and I think they sold it. And sometimes companies do that. They just develop a bunch of IPs visually like this. They do a bunch of visual development on it, and then they sell idea uh, into a studio, and then the studio make, makes it. So for, for example, Sergio Pablos is the creator of Despicable Me cartoon, right? And he's not responsible for the minions, don't worry, right? But what he did is he made a small pitch book, right? And after that, uh, he explored different key moments and a little bit of character designs and stuff like that, and then sold it as a package. Uh, so that's one way of how keyframes work, for example, right? Another way is like, we have an idea, we want to test it out. 
let's pick a few key emotional moments from the story, right? And just see how it works, you know? Most of it will not even make into the movie. Like, for example, here's some key frames from Klaus, also from Marcin Chukobowski, right? And we've never seen uh, this um, frame of... Um, I forgot his name, sorry. Uh, of the mailman fighting, fi fighting the villagers. Uh, Jesper, yes. Uh, his name is Jesper. Uh, yeah, we've never seen that, but the tone... And the story is still there because the city itself hated him as a character, right? So, for example, here we have this moment of Jesper just riding into the village for the first time. And you know what? I'm pretty sure there was a cat that was chased. And there was, I'm pretty sure there was a dead body with uh, creepy babushkas. And I'm pretty sure there was a guy sharpening a sword. So, technically, with this one keyframe, almost a whole moment or a whole sequence was tested out. But it was done just with one image. Uh, and here's some more small foot exploration. See, and here we're kind of going into an industry, very interesting um, kind of like gray zone. Because see, Marcin Jakubowski can do multiple things. He can do an environment, he can do characters, and he's really good with coloring, light, and storytelling, and stuff like that. So he's kind of wearing many hats. And we're approaching, you know, the ultimate Visdev warriors, you know, the Swiss army knife people who are just insane and sometimes I hate them, it's, you know, because they're just so good. And they got to that level with experience, you know, with experience from character design, they might start as character designers for an environment artist and level up other professions. So now they can mix it all up and not be restrained by anything because they can do absolutely everything, right? And here's some more keyframes. For example, I really like um, Ryan Lang's uh, keyframes for Doctor Strange, for example, right? Before the movie was even made, you know, maybe there was a script. You know, he was probably was approached by a director and be like, you know what? I have this really weird idea. It was never done before because Doctor Strange, when the first one came out, did have a lot of interesting visual things. It could. It could be parallel to the um, to the movie Inception and stuff like that, but it still needed to be tested out. So Ryan Lang was just, you know, hired to do very polished, kind of cartoonish in his style, but kind of realistic, you know, cool frames that will just sell the idea, sell the moments, you know. And I couldn't include all of the frames because I had limited space, you know. But if you go on his... Art station account, and you will check out those keyframes. Ryan Lang is the name of the artist. You will technically will see the whole movie in those keyframes being um, tested out. You know, another super uh, awesome artist that I really admire is Toby Trebelka. He's a really good friend of mine. He worked on many movies. He also worked on Klaus. We're gonna have him as as a guest speaker very very soon. So I'm very excited about. It. So. Here's one of his frames that he did for another friend of mine, uh, Rodrigo. His story, um, sadly I forgot the name of it, but it's this keyframe solves many interesting things. It is going to be an actual shot in the animation? I don't know. Probably not, right? But what it does raises a lot of questions, and questions are good, you know? What led up to this point? What's going to be after? Who are those characters, you know? And if keyframes raise questions, that is awesome. I will link all of the artists later on for you to view, guys, so don't worry. Uh, it will be in a separate PDF file, right? So keyframes are there to basically look at the project with a bird's eye view, raise a bunch of questions, you know, and see if the project is interesting, even, right? So that's the role of keyframe artists. Super complex, right? Because you're not just creating pretty images. You're creating pretty images in a context, right? And that context is emotion and story. Visuals are nothing if they're not supporting anything. They're just pretty pixels that are just, just well done. That's it, it's, it's pure skill. And pure skill without emotion and story, in my opinion, is boring. Uh, you can debate on that. There's some amazing illustrators and stuff like that, but for my personal taste, story first, visuals support the story. Regardless, characters, environments, keyframes, illustration, anything. 
All right, now let's get to the fun part, the part that I know about the most. So we have the keyframe illustrators, right? And let's let's put them here, right? So we have illustrators, and then we have kind of like uh, subcategories, right? Which is keyframe, keyframe. Uh, and now we get into color scripting. Super interesting topic. Well, because it's more exciting because that's what I do every day. Hey, <laughs> hey, right? So what is color scripting? Color scripting is, <laughs> and then the, the stream shuts off. Uh, color scripting is previsualization of mood, atmosphere, lighting and emotional progression of our characters over a long period of time. It could be a long period of time in the game. <laughs> it could be a long period of time in the game. It could be a long period of time in animation, feature film, basically anything from point A to point B structure type of a deal, right? In the game, we can pre-visualize what if the viewer or player gets to this level. What does what what emotion does he experience? So, for example, I I couldn't I couldn't fit all the color scripts that I did. So here's some color scripts that I did for um, uh, for Apex and Clash of Clans. You know uh, the super cool one that I'm really proud of and I like because I also have a brother and this animation is about a brother is uh, Lost and Crowned uh, done by Supercell. I color scripted from beginning to an end, right? And it's a it's a small story about two brothers, you know, and there's ups and downs. And what my job as a color script artist is to take a storyboard, you know, it's usually black and white or online, watch the animatic or the storyboard, or read the script with the storyboard. Sometimes I even get script without a storyboard and I have to basically paint my own simple frames from beginning to an end. So for example, five more sleeps color script, that was like 135 frames that I did in <laughs> three months, I think. It was it was a huge color script. For for a long period of time I worked without a storyboard at all. And I was pre visualizing my own frames, but mainly focusing on the story compositionally, yes, but mainly, mainly focusing on the lighting. And then when the storyboard came in, I replaced the frames or painted on top of them, stuff like that. Yeah, so what's the main goal of a color script artist or mood and atmosphere artist, right? Is to figure out what the story is all about first, right? What the viewer needs to experience in the shot. And then he simulates those feelings with light bulbs. You know, by switching them on and off, by switching time of day, time of year, um, the weather conditions, you know, dim light, hard light, key light, all of those things that he manipulates has to push the story to the next level, you know? And color key artists, they can wear many hats too, right? Because they can think about the script and the story and represent it through color. Like for example, this one was crazy because it was it was Mary Logmas for Supercell, and I had to tell a story of a sentient log that turned evil. You know, so I have a it was sad and then evil. So I turned a blue light on, and I have some red from from the city, and then I need to have some flashbacks with madness and a little bit of scariness. You know, and I hope this looks mad enough and kind of scary. You know, uh, and kind of like. World War II vibes and stuff like that, right? And when the storyboards came in, I really like this shot because it's kind of like the light is coming at them and the log is chasing them. But when I was given this, there was only a naked storyboard without almost no lighting, you know? And that's my job as a color script artist, you know? Or a color and light artist or mood and atmosphere lightest, uh, art, artist lightest. <laughs> Another thing that I do a lot of the times when... Um, I do color keys is I do time of day studies, you know, uh, because a lot of the times the production need to see not only story specific things, right, but they just need to see overall, you know, a range of emotion that we're going to have um, 
in the story or in the game or something like that. Like those images are from a color and light course that are done really long time ago, right? And those are little studies on time of day, you know? And like, for example, uh, it's really helpful to plan something like this beforehand. And that's what I did, for example, in the color script um, for five more sleeps, this giant one, right? Um, because I know you probably can't really tell, but we have morning cycle, then have day cycle, then we have evening cycle, super evening cycle, and then we have a night cycle, and then we have a super hopeful uh, morning cycle, right? And all this was planned with little studies that I showed you here, right? Time of day studies. Another thing is that sometimes the ability to change mood just with time of day, like for example, like here, like this in this painting looks completely different, even though the composition is almost absolutely the same, right? The only thing that I change is the chain here, right? Same thing here, it looks completely different from here, almost like a different painting, the same thing here. You want a super cool epic warrior vibe? Here you go. Lighting can do anything. So yeah, that's a little bit into what color scripting does or mood, color, and atmosphere artists do, you know? Um, and after that, we have little categories. So let me, in my doodle board, uh, I put the color scripting. Illustration, keyframe, color scripting, right? Uh, and after all of that, right what do we have left uh and i call those you know the mega chad <laughs> warriors you know it's called mixed you know mixed martial arts artists it's you know it's people who basically you know they took every little thing out of this thing and they can by themselves <laughs> fucking santa claus yes um they can by themselves design the whole project the whole world and usually those are artists i would say they are very rare but they're a little bit hard to find why because those are the people who started somewhere. They could have started as a character designer. They could have started as an environment artist or an illustrator. And then they leveled up all other skills, you know? And now they can do a full package. So for example, sometimes I got hired for one project that uh, needed a bunch of, basically, it, it's a goblin game about goblins. They made a release, it's called Goons and Goblins. I can't show anything because it's under, under NDA, but uh, the producer or the director, a really cool guy, a really dear friend of mine named Sabri, uh, he said, hey Misha, I know you like world building, I know you like characters, I know you like key moments and key frames and stuff like that. We have no idea how the kind of the world works like, you know, we have no idea what the emotion behind it is. And you know what, why won't I hire you for a few weeks or months and you just have fun in the world, you know? And those jobs come rare, but you know, they do come sometimes. And what my responsibility was is basically figuring out a bunch of, you know, where do I start? So I started with like a, like a map of the world and then into, and then I did a little village of the goblins and then I did a little house and then I did different characters and those characters inspired keyframe moments, you know, and then I delivered the whole package and basically the package was used to inspire the team later on to influence the game. And even though the game is not going to be almost in no uh, shape or form represent what I did, but the whole world building aspect of it and the whole package of what that world was, was really important because the team could be inspired by the same source material of what this world is and then that would dictate the gameplay sometimes or the visual aspect of everything right so i love those kind of jobs but those jobs usually come rarely why because it takes kind of a special relationship between the director and the artist to communicate on a, on, on one language and the director needs to see the value in that and not, and not every director works that way, you know? Some directors like to be very methodical, right? And they would hire like a character designer, 
right? They will hire an environment artist that can do props. Uh, they can hire a keyframe artist and then a color script artist. But again, they could be mixed martial arts. Like for example, uh, I myself, I'm doing color scripting, right? But sometimes they can do two, they can do keyframe too and illustration too. Why? Because keyframes are a little bit more polished color scripts and illustration is a little bit more polished keyframes. But keyframes can be in quality like illustrations, right? So it's a it's a mixed martial arts and anything is possible. So for example, if you're right now thinking like, should I become this? Should I become that? Should I become this? It doesn't really matter. You need to start somewhere. And if you are very passionate about story, if you're very passionate about industry, later on, you can add on other skills on top and become the ultimate <laughs> artist warrior, you know? But the thing is, it's not a pedestal for doing everything, you know? There's very few people who can do everything to a high quality, you know? I only know two or three people and I can't do that. I usually have strong suits, right? Which mine is atmosphere and lighting, a little bit of composition and storytelling. My character designs could be better, you know? Everything else could be better, but that's okay. Because if I know just a little bit of it with all other strong skills that I have, I can kind of make up for it, right? So yeah, that's the general description of all of the stations of visual development, right? Let's summarize it. And let me get some water because <clears throat> my voice is cracking. Let's summarize what does visual development artist does, right? Because we've, we've talked about many cool things, right? And kind of what the responsibility is, but let's summarize it, you know? And I have an official, you know, I have an official description of what visual development is from Google. And let's see if it's correct, right? And, you know, let me do a screenshot so everyone can see it at the same time, you know, and see if the Google is correct, right? So, visual development is, drum roll, visual development is a professional field in the visual arts that, re that relates to building the look, feel, and atmosphere of a world. Visual development deals with designing an environment, establishing the color scheme for the environment, and drawing the characters that are part of it. Do I agree with this statement? Eh, it's, I think it's like 80% there, right? I would change it to something like this. Visual development artists are artists who are designing the world, the character, the mood, the atmosphere, the style of a narrative, in the context of a story, you know? Because we're not designing for the sake of designing, for the sake of it being looking, being and looking cool, you know? We are designing for a specific reason. And that reason should be within the project, right? Um, <laughs> I see people crying in the chats, what about the storyboards? That's an extra, right? We still have to figure out what this classic visual development right so yes world basically world creators world builders that inhabit uh their own world with environments characters specific key emotional moments through different tools color light composition acting of the characters which is gesture and so on and so on and so on someone pointed out what about the storyboard artist, you know? And I love storyboarding. Probably the most complex thing that I ever did in my life is storyboarding in animatics. And we're gonna cover that in future lecture, uh, lectures, don't worry, you know? But storyboarding is, as a profession, right? It's called storyboarding. Can it be technically be visual development? Let's think about it. You get a script. Right? But a story. You know, a Viking, super cool Viking story. You know, and then you give it to a poor storyboard artist who has to do 5 billion frames in like two days. You know, so what he does, he is solving a visual problem, right? He is analyzing the script, figuring out the story, figuring out the cameras, figuring out the pace where to start, what to do, what the action is going to be. And he basically pre-visualizes 
everything in small illustrations, which is frame, frame, frame. But he, ha he has to think not about one frame, but he has to think about multiple frames all next to each other, right? Technically, yes, you can technically call storyboarding I guess visual development because what it solves a narrative problem right keyframe solves a narrative problem because it's basically a pause in an animatic but now with color and final thing right but regularly or usually storyboarding it's 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 its own thing should visual development artists have storyboarding skills absolutely that's why I am including storyboarding for visual development artists. But storyboard artists usually they just solve a little bit of a different problem because let's say visual development in understanding that usually the common understanding of visual development is it's mainly uh, design, style, mood, basically anything visual right storyboarding is much more than just visual because in storyboarding yes some storyboard artists even tone their storyboards and they can communicate lighting that's an extra uh do they communicate visually yes but do they take care of design sometimes depending on the on the storyboard artist they can come up with stuff on the flow you know but what they think about they think about drama they think about script they think about um framing and because there's not much design involved, it's a different type of a puzzle solving, different type of design. That's why storyboarding usually is separately. Uh, should have should it be should it be under the you know visual development umbrella, right? Because to be honest, the the, the key word visual development it is kind of like an umbrella. It's many 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 you know, it's 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 many many professions, right? underneath one keyword, right? Which is VizDev, right? And storyboarding, eh, technically, yes, but at the same time, not really, right? But the skills of storyboarding are super beneficial to, to, the, to the character designers, environment prop designers, you know, and stuff like that, because if you can come up with a whole story or a little storyboard inside your head, where that cup was 500 years ago, that storytelling skills that comes from storyboarding, understanding what story is and stuff like that. So that's why I included in the program the storyboarding for visual development. All right, let's recap. We are builders of worlds. We are creators of characters that we can basically feel and touch and speak to you know we design moods and atmosphere and we play with people's souls and emotions through different tools like lighting uh, composition perspective camera and so on and so on and so on visual development um, career or title can come in many shapes or form you can be master of all Right, or it can be a combination of different things, which is like keyframe, color scripting. Uh, but overall, I'm gonna tell you this: visual development is all about story, you know, and what parts of the story you like telling the most. So, if in today's call or in today's lecture, you you know you heard something that kind of like brings it home, and you're like, you know what, I really like this or I really like what he talked about here and stuff like that. And we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about it, but note those things. And if you have, if you like many things, that's not a problem, right? Because we're going to test your skills on everything during all of this. So maybe you're going to, I don't know, stay with one thing for a few years and then you're going to level up your skills to the next level, to the next level, and you're going to try out different things. So. Later on, you're going to work yourself up to the ultimate VizDev Viking warrior that does everything, you know, because you like to have your hands on everything. You like to develop the characters. You want to think about the world that they live in. You want to experience the emotional moments with them. You want to create that final piece of cover art for the poster, 
right? And you want to color script everything for the animatic. You can be the Swiss Army, <laughs> Swiss Army knife uh, artist, you know? But usually at times at the right time, at the right moment, and when you accumulate a little bit more um, of experience. So, for now, I think I covered everything that I wanted to. So now, it's time for Q&A, right? Uh, questions and answers from you, not questions and answers. Questions from you, hopefully, answers from me, right? I gonna jump, <laughs> I'm gonna make a leap of faith, or maybe read the chat. There's a lot of people in the voice chat. If people will start yelling, we can't go in alphabetical order. <laughs> uh, answers, answers from you and question from me. Uh, that'll be fun, you know, it'll be fun. But we can do it later when I'll be talking about what your uh, career goals and stuff like that. Uh, you know what? I will wait until my moderators, um, you know, maybe accumulate a few questions, you know, uh yeah for now i'm not gonna go into discord because i'm terrified do you want to see uh, the army of you that we have look at this guys an e never ending never ending you know can we can we just yell something in chat like something biking like no. all together <laughs> uh but yeah, what, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, my moderators to maybe uh, collect the most common questions, right? And while they do that, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit on how this whole thing is going to continue uh, operating, what I want from you guys, and what the homework is going to be, right? So... <laughs> Yeah, thank you for the thank you for the Viking chance in the chat. Uh, yeah, so the main thing that I want to talk to, besides what is visual development, right? Because it's so interesting. Now we talked a little bit about what is what and stuff like that, right? But the whole approach to, I guess, to this art camp, right? And what we're gonna do here. So at the end of what I'm going to talk about now, we're going to talk about homework and assignments, right? But the most important thing I want to talk about your mentality, right? This dev topic is super complex. A lot of people, a lot of artists get very overwhelmed with the sometimes amount of the information, right? Today, we're just testing the grounds and we just, we're, we're not, we didn't even scratch the surface, right? I tried to go as fast as possible through each station, right? So, uh, with overwhelming amount of information and tasks and assignments, some people can get this courage or something like that. So right now I want to talk a little bit about your professional mentality. You know, there's no difference between you and people who already work in the industry, right? I work in the industry, I'm no better than you. And you're now no worse than me, right? Because professional mentality, right? It's a thing that even super skillful artists sometimes don't have, right? It's, uh, I am, am where I am, skill-wise, and I'm growing. I'm going towards my goal, right? Um, and maybe I'm not perfect, right? But I am work in progress, right? I'm gonna approach this as my task and I do it to my best ability and if I complete it, good job. If, if I could do better, I'll do better next time. Because if we're gonna, you know, if we're starting something new and we fail, that's okay, you know, because failing is the quickest route to actually becoming a good artist, right? In each of us, we have, let's say, let's say you paint one painting each month, right? And in every artist, we have 10 to 15 bad paintings in us, sometimes 100, before we get to a good painting. So if you do one painting a month and every hundredth painting of yours is a good painting, right? How many months are it gonna take you to create your really good painting, right? So it's all about making as many mistakes, 
being very gracious to yourself, patting yourself on the back when you can, right? But no whining, no self-bashing, and you know, and self-sabotaging, because it's only gonna bring complications that are not necessary. And I try to encourage that you think about helpful questions. Why does this art suck, for example? And you're gonna like, A, does this suck? B, does this suck? No, but you never do this. Man, I suck. My art sucks, period. That's it. You know, I don't like that. You know, I'm gonna strongly discourage that because usually it doesn't bring people to anything productive and fruitful, you know. And sometimes you need to ask for help so people can help you, guide you. And this is the perfect environment to make as many mistakes, you know, and have as many people help you, you know, to make those mistakes and then fix them, you know. Because the key to fast art and high quality art is this. You make a lot of mistakes really, really fast and then you fix them as fast as possible. So that's the mentality I want you to have on or during this camp. So now, while you're still uh, writing questions, and there's a lot of them, I'm gonna talk about your assignment. And when is your deadline for that assignment? So for the first week, we're not gonna be doing much painting. We're gonna be simulating a real life pipeline of a production, right? And that is, reference gathering. <laughs> I know it doesn't sound really fun, but it's the most important uh, part of any project, right? It's research, right? So what I want you to do is create one mood board. And you can go wild with it. Just don't go more than 100 images, please, right? One mood board, board, crap, board. How do I spell the word board? Well, word. Uh, board. At least you can spell mood board. One mood board. It's gonna look something like a bunch of images, you know. It has to answer a few questions of yours, you know. It's gonna look something. Go on a pine trees, go on Google, go on anything. So, question number one, right? What is your world feels like okay it's very important that when you gather reference when you start any image in general any picture making it always starts with how it makes you feel you know what's the core emotion is it cold is it hot is it scary is it cute, you know? Because art without emotion is nothing, right? So first question that you need to answer, what is your world feels like? How, or how, how does, how does your world feels like? Is that the correct one? How does your world, how does your world feels like? Is that the correct sentence? You understood, you understood the gist. English is not my first language, I apologize. Uh, please, when you can be gathering images, you can also look at videos, you can get inspired by your old projects, you know? And, you know, a lot of the times when I start a new project and I try to get inspired, I'll go on YouTube and I have a playlist of like Lord of the Rings moments or The Hobbit. It's still pretty okay, not the best, but <laughs> what I do is I try to feel something. It could be music, it could be just pictures, it could be documentaries, it could be just images, you know? And I try to capture that feeling and try to incorporate that into my world. So yeah, first task, how does your world feel like? And then you're like, you find yourself at 2 a.m. watching Gandalf writing on the third day to save <laughs> Theodon, and you're like, yes, Gandalf, let's go. Um, okay, sounded kind of wrong, sorry guys. Um, and then you cry till 3 a.m. because uh, it's so it's such a powerful 
music. Howard Shore does an amazing job with the music score. The visuals are there, right? And that's the core emotion that I capture. And then later on, I try to recapture something like this too. If you are experiencing an emotion or you're feeling something when you look at even at references, hopefully that's going to translate into your art and then you're going to make your audience or the viewer feel the same way. Okay, how does your world feels like, right? How does it look? Three. Who lives in it? Four. Who is your main character? Disclaimer. On week two, we're going to be drawing or painting a character in his environment. Kind of something, whatever is, whatever Toby, Toby did in uh, keyframes. Something like this. You can turn your own spin on it, but this is our work up to this moment, to our big keyframe and stuff like that. Because... Um, we need to develop one frame that makes us question or makes us want to explore more into the world. So it's going to be one character in the environment and you can populate the environment with anything that you want. It could be just mountains, kind of like this. You know, it could be, you know, a city if you want, if you have enough skill to do a whole city in a week. You know, but it has to be something simple and not too complicated. And, um, you know, try to not burn yourself out on week one and just try uh, your best to do what you can, you know. And then we're going to be designing. You're going to make a bunch of mistakes on the first assignment. And then we're going to capture or lecture you on every aspect of picture making. And then you can adjust your picture and create new pictures in addition to it according to the new lecture material. So my main goal with you in this assignment is first mood board, ask a bunch of questions to develop your own world, you know, and paint without me helping you for, 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 the, for the first week. Your first explorational visual development piece, which is who is my character in an environment and it should um, it should raise a bunch of questions and answer those questions right uh, on week two so next Monday I'll elaborate a little bit more on this task but for now this is more than enough I will summarize it all and post it into homework channel so do not worry you will not lose it you know who listens carefully may, may you know write it down but that's the main task please have fun with it you know uh and the sky is the limit i had a lot of questions is everything viking themed in this camp you can make a viking theme thing if you want uh but my goal is to make uh, to make sure that i am helping you to tell your story okay if you like Vikings like I do, sure, go ahead. Uh, I'll be developing my Lumber Saga animation project. That's some of the test footage you saw it in the teaser for this camp, you know. But the sky is the limit. You are in your own voice. But if you are lost and you are like, this is too responsible for me to develop a whole AP. I have other solutions for you. If, if you are terrified of building a whole world from scratch what you can do is you can take an existing IP you can take the story of Tarzan I don't know some pirate story or some survivor in the mountains or or some fairy tale or an existing character in animation and try to develop that further right so you can take existing source material in the beginning, I had an idea that you guys can technically try and help and work on my Lumber Saga project for Vikings that I did. But 
I don't want to spoil it. The story is super cool in it. And for now, it's not going to be an option, right? Uh, but you can do Viking related stuff. So that's the homework. We're done with the lecture material. We're done with the assignments. And now, now, time for Q&A. Okay, I hope my mods gathered the questions or I can just crawl up and try to find everything. <sighs> okay, blah, 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 blah. question. Is keyframing color scripting used only for big budget projects for big companies? Where do we find these jobs? Okay, keyframing color scripting are not used only for big budgets and big companies. Color scripting is a tool to visualize your entire story. And good companies use color scripting and keyframes to solve as many problems before they commit the budget to actual production. You know, Because for example, if an entire team of 3D artists, and those are the people who use color, key, color keys, they go ahead and start lighting the whole animation, there's 20 minutes, and mood doesn't work at the end of the roll, and they have to send out the keyframes or the screenshots of the renders to the artists and then do paint overs. That's gonna be work done twice, firstly. And secondly, they're gonna spend uh, twice the budget on it. What? Okay. Another really good question that we have is, what is the difference between concept artists and visual development artists? Honestly, in my opinion, you know, there's no difference. But concept art is usually used in the game industry. We need some concept art. Visual development is usually used for films and animation, but if I would try to distinct what their main um, what their main task is, so for example, let's have concept artist here, right? And then we have this dev guy here. So I say concept artists usually tackle design more. Right, so visual development artists can kind of go into design aspect, but they try to go very wide with it. They try to kind of like, you know, just pave the way, do a few sketches, but not commit to anything super seriously. For concept artists, you know, usually they try to design something already functional, something already game ready, something they're going to be already model, right? So I say visual development almost equals concept art. But I would say this dev guys usually come in early on, you know, in the blue sky area, they pave the way, and then the concept artist, who can technically be called visual development artists, they would go and they would go into specifics. They would, they would, they would get a bunch of characters and they would just create one that is final, is gonna be handed out to the 3D team and stuff like that. They will go and do this final vehicle design, stuff like that. So I say in my head, concept art equals this dev. It's just, again, one is used more in games and others used more in animation. In my mind, visual development usually comes in earlier, right? And just goes wide and kind of like bird's eye view on things, they test a lot of things. But then when it comes to specifics, then specific character designer slash character concept artist comes in. Environment concept art school starts, because a lot of times in people's uh, you know bios, they're gonna be like environment artist slash visual development artist. And mine is like, for a while was environment artist slash visual development artist, right? It's just, it's kind of the same thing. It just emphasizes different things. So for example, if I'm gonna say, I'm a visual development artist, that means, that could be mean anything. That means like, I can go wide and ex explore a lot of things in the beginning and just go loose and just go start wide and then slowly narrow it down. 
And I say for me, visual development start wide, you know, as wide as possible, and they just do a bunch of stuff, you know. And when think when things starts narrowing down, you know, that's when concept artists uh, come in, you know, when they're designing super specific things. But concept artists can also come in super early on, and technically, when they're going to be doing, I don't know, creatures or vehicle designs or environments, they can be called visual development artists. To be honest, it's almost the same thing. All right, second question. My, my people, they found common asked questions. Question, do we make a mood board for each question of one mood board that answers all the questions at once? No, you just do one mood board for all of the questions. Or you keep those questions in mind while you do the mood board. The questions are for you to answer in your head and to influence your mood board assemblage. I don't know if that's a word. Question, any style or the one that makes it easier? 2D. Any style that you want. Or you know what? Let me be a little bit more specific. Because you know what? Not everybody has already a developed style. I have number five. I didn't have it in my original notes. I just forgot. Choose your style. And stick with it. refs also gathered in the mood board for style right because i want you to not to invent anything not to like find yourself as an artist in 10 weeks which is impossible right i want you to um i want you to start something from the beginning to an end and have everything done consistently in one style so when you post it to your portfolio, people can be like, okay, he can work in this X style, for example. All right, next question. Should we do it in English? I mean, a script for my character and environment, or I can do it in Russian? You can do it in Russian. Uh, I never told you to write a script. I told you to think about those things. If it's better for you to write those things out, do write them out, please. Does it have to be in English? No. Uh, can it be in Russian? Of course. Because the thing is, I'm not going to be reading that. You're going to be reading that. You're creating a world for yourself. And you are setting those rules. Uh, and you figuring things out. All right, next question. Should we treat the assignment as if it's for feature film gaze or is it our choice? It is your choice. So technically, if you want to create your animation short, or something like that. Treated this as pre-production for your animation short. If you want to do a feature film, you're a matte painter, do that. If you're a storyboard artist and you can use this as just, you know, as inspirational talk and you want to do your storyboard artist, again, I'm not here to give you boundaries. I want you to practice, you know, the burden of responsibilities of developing your own project and evolving your own artistic voice and your own artistic voice will develop only if you're going to start raising questions in your head why is this important to me why is this emotion important to me what do i want to say to the world right i'm trying to raise this artistic responsibility in all of you guys you know and give you tools how to express those so you do you do whatever the hell you want you know and if you're confused or overwhelmed, I already gave you options. You can start a book that is already established, right? Or existing project or something like that. Or your own project. So the sky is the limit. All right. Question, is it only for solo? It might have something to do with group of five. Uh, in the beginning, I had an idea that you guys, and if you want to, you are more than welcome to. You can go and form alliances, you know? And for example, someone is a character designer there, right? Uh, someone is an environment artist is there, right? And what you can do is you can be a little studio and develop a project together. I am all for that. And if you want to do that, please do. What you can do is you can maybe do like a little private chat with a group of five and maybe discuss it in a voice chat and, and post it or something like that. If you guys need groups, 
I can create separate voice chats for you. We are a community. We're doing whatever the hell we want for the duration of summer. We're having fun. And at the same time, Misha is going to be babbling in the background <laughs> with useful things that are going to help you tell your story. And then you're going to post it to your art station, become famous and awesome and super rich from you know, gaining success overnight. That's going to happen, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, okay. Can we combine 2D and 3D in homework? Sure. I don't care what tools you use. I don't, those are just tools, you know. Um, sure, combine 2D and 3D. You know what? 3D skills are super crucial. So if you want to develop those or you're developing those, um, as we say in Russian, flag into your hands. Flag to be ruke. Okay. I have someone says character design is more specific with focusing solely on characters and concept arts are broader with character and wiper props, etc. Yes. Uh, can be mood board use other artists that inspire me. Yes, that's what I said before. Um, <laughs> yes. All right. So don't worry, guys. I will recap the homework in the homework channel. I am so sorry I cannot answer all of your questions because it's a lot of them. And I am very grateful that we have, honestly, you know, so many people joining. There's like what? How many? I blocked the viewer count so I don't get stressed by it, right? But there's like a lot of people here, right? So the main thing to recap and to kind of wrap this thing, our first awesome number one lecture is this. Sky's the limit. I told you what the prof each profession does, you know. And now the responsibility of what you do with this knowledge, well, I guess we didn't, we didn't talk about the specifics yet, but regarding for your own project, what you're going to do with your own project, you are responsible for yourself, for your story, answer those questions, but make sure that the art that you do is personal. That what you're trying to tell is you. You know how my dad says, like, every artist is, is basically like a prophet or a preacher. And if he has nothing to say, he's a bad artist. If he has something to say, he's a good artist. Try to find that something that you want to say. Try to find that thing that always kept you inspired in animation, series, you know, Find that, you know, you, Juju, you know, your style, you know, your understanding of what's cool. Don't try to imitate other people. You know, I hate when people go into art station and, and they say, man, I want to paint like this guy. No, you don't. You want to paint like you, you know. So later on, other people are going to be like, you know what, this guy inspires me. You know, because right now I'm going to tell you, and this is probably the most important thing about visual development. The industry is super small and there's a few visual development pieces that are kind of like setting up the pace. You know, you have Gabriel Gomez that is super cool visual development artist and his color palettes. You have maybe like Samuel Smith and then you have like, I don't know, Snotty who worked for Riot Games. And you have like, you know, those kind of like super cool, you know, like regular looking vis dev pieces. And it's like, a, it gets recycled. And every time I look at the new portfolio of a next VisDev guy, it looks like I all seen it before. It's all the same things. There's there's new twist. There's no new twist on the material. It's because people are trying to paint like other people, and they're not connecting to what they are really are and where they live. You know, a lot of you people live in different countries. You know, each country has. A different sets of rules as its own you know it has its own mentality its own traditions its own its own folklore you know and each of you guys have an amazing experience of your own life and no one else can live your own life but you you know that personal experience is what makes you you and you know what 
there's a lot of hurt in the world and a lot of sadness. There's a lot of joy and a lot of happiness, camaraderie, you know, friendship, you know, honor, battle, epicness, and stuff like that, yeah. And, you know, don't be shy to experience those emotions and make your art like almost like art therapy, you know. Because, I'll tell you this, you, you look at a riot splash art next to a good keyframe, that has emotion, but it's maybe executed not the same way, you know? And you know what? Emotions, what matters in, in images, you know, especially in visual development, because you know what? Directors, they do look on artistic skills and I guess your hard skills and soft skills and stuff like that. But if you're gonna have, you know, if you're gonna have emotion and you're gonna have you in your portfolio, you're going to be hired to be you to look at the project through your own lens through your own perspective and your own artistic voice and choice okay so don't try to be others you know don't try to be not yourself learn the fundamentals don't compare yourself to anyone else but yourself yesterday okay and if you're gonna like get nothing from this camp but this you should go a long way, you know, because right now the problem is not the lack of skill. The problem is there's a lack of connection to the personal art. There's a lack of understanding what is good story, what is good emotion. And people don't, don't have passion anymore for what they do. That's why we get sucky animation projects. That's why we get sucky, super expensive video games. It's because the industry is drained of those people. People are burned out. And you know what? You are the new generation. And I hope, I hope that very soon there's going to be a next wave of like double A, triple A indie games, new Pixar, new Disney. And honestly, you guys, like, you are that generation, you know? Like, I am slowly approaching to get my animation, for example, done. I have, if, then, if, if no one knows, I have my own number saga project. I've been working for it, like, I don't know, for the last seven years. And you know what? It's going somewhere, but it's going slowly. But you know what? That's the inner fire that I'm trying to keep. And that's the project that I usually try to tell my stories and things that touches me deeply. Like, for example, yesterday, <laughs> it was kind of funny. I was watching uh, Instagram and there was like a, there was a video of a, of a crippled guy in a wheelchair. And, you know, it was some kind of classic thing. Someone's helping someone out, you know. Um, but I was like, I was very emotional for like the whole evening because my personal project, The Lumber Saga, it's um, the main premise is broken people trying to get their lives together, you know. And what can be even more broken than, you know, a crippled guy in a wheelchair? Um, and, you know, like, that's, that's the thing that, you know, makes art great. You know, that's, that's what brings emotion. Um, uh, that's like, that was, that's what brings emotion to, to your paintings. And if you guys can try to find something like this, um, like if you can find something like this in your personal art when you do the mood board, uh, that would be great. So yeah, I think for today, uh, we are done. I am so happy that so many people are participating in this and I don't know what to say, you know. Thank you so much for joining this. This is gonna be epic. This is gonna be awesome. Um, I have no idea where you're writing numbers in the chat box. <laughs> uh, but we're gonna meet on Tuesday with our guest speaker, Borja Pena, who is a director. And please don't miss it because he is a very, very busy man. He has a lot of things to say and 
you know what, I'm so grateful I have super cool friends who are willing to participate in all of this. So for now, stay epic, guys. Stay hydrated, stay inspired, create your mood board. I gonna be monitoring all of the chats, okay? So please commit to this, not for my sake. Do not do it for me, do it for yourself, you know? And I'll try to be a good leader in this and show by example. And hopefully when we emerge victorious from all of this, all of us are going to become greater storytellers, greater artists, and overall we'll discover something more about our own selves, you know, our own personal art. And if a couple of people will get a job from that or good portfolio pieces, I'm happy, you know. Anyways, skull everybody. I will see you on Wednesday. All the homework and assignments I will update. So just keep your eyes peeled and share this thing if you want with anybody who will find this useful. Skull. Bye-bye, everybody.